Welcome everyone to Disability in DC Metro, Innovative Approaches to Increasing Self-ID. This session was recorded, so if you have any questions or comments, please note to send it to Catherine, myself, or Kevin Carpenter, or Elise, as you note that their slides, their email is there. Next slide, please. My name is Catherine McCary, and I'm the CEO of the Disability Inn DC Metro, and I'm also president of C5 Consulting. Today, we're going to do a quick high level on Disability Inn DC Metro and introduce our speakers, Elise and Kevin. Next slide. Going into the PowerPoint, we're going to talk about EARN, NILG, and ODEP, and we'll explain all of those acronyms. We'll look at the toolkit overview discuss the difference between self-identification and self-disclosure, the value of self-ID, federal contractors, challenges and successes, the five steps in the toolkit, which is called engaging employees to measure success, innovative approaches to encouraging self-identification of disability, and then finally resources and contact information. Next slide. The DC Metro chapter of Disability Inn is a nonprofit organization, and our mission is building the business network for disability inclusion. Our purpose is to engage employers in a dialogue through education and resources with a focus on removing attitudinal and organizational barriers, and by exchanging best practices to ensure that talent with disabilities are included, retained, and promoted in today's workforce. Please visit our website to learn more about our chapter. Next slide. We are very fortunate to have two fabulous presenters with us, Elise Switzer, who works for the Employer Assistance and Resource Network on Disability Inclusion, which is EARN. She is the Compliance and Technical Assistant and Training Specialist. And Kevin Carpenter, who works for Wells Par Fargo, he is the Vice President and Affirmative Action Consultant and serves on the board for the National Industry Liaison Group. Next slide. A quick overview for what EARN and NILG are. As I said, Employer Assistance and Resource Network on Disability Inclusion, it's a no-cost resource for employers seeking to proactively recruit, hire, retain, and advance qualified employees with disabilities by accessing trainings, webinars, and numerous publications. It's a collaborative of multiple partners with expertise in technical assistance, training, and research, and is funded through a cooperative agreement with the U.S. Department of Labor Office of Disability Employment Policy. You can see their website there. The National Industry Liaison Group is a consortium of professionals of federal contractors and subcontractors with regulatory agencies, working toward achieving equal employment opportunities for all. Their mission is to support local industry groups, coordinate the annual conference, provide comments and feedback to regulators, and liaise with OFCCP, the Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs, ODEP, the Office of Disability Employment Policy, VETS, the Veteran, Veterans Employment Training Services, EEOC, Equal Opportunity Commission, and related stakeholders. And there's their website there. Next slide, and Kevin, I'll turn it over to you. All right, thank you, Catherine. Uh, we are uh, very proud to say that the NILG and ODEP, along with EARN, have a, a formal alliance in place, which has been very beneficial to our constituents uh, over the years. Through this alliance, we have been able to provide timely training and education, outreach and communication, and uh, even more importantly, continue to promote the national dialogue on the recruitment, hiring, advancing, and retaining of workers with disabilities. One prime example of the positive aspects of this alliance is the creation of the Self-ID Toolkit. Next slide, please. This toolkit outlines the strategies to address the main barriers to self-identification and provides examples of innovative approaches some businesses have taken to increase self-identification rates. So with that, I would like to turn it over to my colleague, Elise. Thanks so much, Kevin, uh, for that helpful information. So next slide, please. Okay. 
So to begin with, um, it's extremely important that we all have a common understanding of what self-ID is and what it isn't. So self-ID is uh, voluntarily and confidentially providing information about disability status that is used for statistical purposes only. In other words, for data collection and reporting purposes. Self-ID is not the same as disclosure. So let's take a moment to look at some key differences. Next slide. The process of self-identifying for the purpose of affirmative action compliance is not the same as disclosing a disability for other reasons. Self-ID is purely a data collection process, whereas disclosure of a disability is required to obtain a reasonable accommodation or to participate in a targeted recruitment program, for example. Sometimes people disclose for other reasons, like joining an affinity group or to create a sense of understanding and inclusion in the workplace. The distinction between these two actions can be confusing for employees as well, who may believe they are disclosing when they self-identify. One reason why communication strategies are so important, which we'll discuss later on in this presentation. Next slide. A strong self-ID program which includes proactive and positive communication regarding its purpose can actually help to create a welcoming environment for people with both known and non-apparent disabilities. And under Section 503 of the Rehab Act, businesses with $10,000 or more in federal contracts are required to collect data on disability status from all applicants and periodically from incumbent employees. Next slide. NILG surveyed its members in 2019 and asked about self-ID practices. And we learned that 43% are meeting the minimum requirement of once every five years, but 23% are conducting self-ID campaigns annually. Most companies are only seeing a one to 2% self-ID rate and only one third have seen an increase in that number since the implementation of rules under section 503. Next slide. This is consistent with findings from a study conducted by my colleagues, Suzanne Briere and Sarah Van Schrader in 2018. Of their respondents, only 15% of federal contractors were meeting or exceeding the 7% utilization goal established by those rules. Next slide. In a separate survey of people with disabilities conducted back in 2010, Researchers at the Yangtian Institute found that there are several barriers which might prevent someone from wanting to disclose a disability. Although the survey specifically addresses disclosure and it predates the 503 rules, these factors are still likely to be major contributors to the decision making processes of people who may or may not choose to self ID. So those factors include the risk of being fired or not hired to begin with 73% of respondents um, felt strongly that this presented a barrier to disclosure, that there was a fear among 62% of respondents that um, their employer may focus on their disability rather than their performance after they disclosed. Some risk losing health care or being discriminated against in regard to health care access. Um, many feared limited opportunities for advancement and promotion once they disclose a disability. They also feared that their supervisor might not be supportive, and many were concerned more than half that they risked being treated differently in the workplace or being viewed differently by colleagues and others as a result of disclosure. And 44% of respondents said there's really no impact on my ability to do my job, so I don't see why it's necessary to disclose, and nearly 30% desired a privacy um, in their decision to not disclose a non-apparent disability. Next slide. In order to help contractors mitigate some of these barriers, EARN has created a resource that addresses the five most common reasons that employees may have for not self-identifying and includes strategies for overcoming those objections. The URL on this slide will take you to that resource on the EARN site, and I'm gonna provide you with an overview on the following slides. Next slide. The strategies are organized under five sections, which include ensuring opportunities for all, creating a welcoming environment, supporting health and wellness, ensuring privacy, and explaining the reasons for self-ID. 
On the following slides, we'll review some of those strategies and how you might use those strategies to improve the results of self-ID campaigns. Next slide. So the following are some of the research-based strategies that are recommended to improve self-ID rates, as well as improve overall disability inclusion efforts. In regard to communicating your intentions around the inclusion, uh, around inclusion in self-ID, one of the most public-facing ways to do this is by including disability explicitly in diversity statements. Regarding the self-ID form itself, make sure to explain how data is used to improve the representation of people with disabilities in the workplace. And when recruiting, explicitly target job seekers with disabilities by partnering with community-based agencies, using disability-focused job boards, and letting college career offices know that you're interested in qualified candidates with disabilities. Make sure you communicate procedures for hiring and advancement in a way that emphasizes fairness and a level playing field to mitigate fears that people with disabilities might have about being passed over. And consider disability in terms of broader DNI initiatives. Ensure that there are parallel efforts which relate to disability as diversity. Next slide. Getting people in the door is really only half the battle. The other half is keeping them there. So some suggested strategies for retention include creating professional development programs that are aimed at talented employees with disabilities, reach out to those employees and encourage them to engage in ongoing career development opportunities that are available to everyone. Make sure that workspaces and digital platforms are proactively accommodating to people with disabilities in order to maximize productivity and increase a sense of belonging in the workplace and highlight the successes of people with disabilities but not in a way that exceptionalizes them or uses them as a source of inspiration. Be sure to highlight genuine achievements of people with disabilities in the workplace. Next slide. One of the most important things that we've learned from the survey research I described earlier is that a supportive supervisor is often the make or break point for employees with disabilities. So make sure supervisors are well equipped to support and professionally develop people with disabilities as they would others. So one way to do this is to conduct disability awareness and diversity training. But again, the goal is to normalize disability as part of the human experience, not to otherize it. Make sure that performance standards are also consistent for people with disabilities because it can have a limiting effect on career development when these standards are either unintentionally lowered or raised for employees with disabilities. And make sure that engagement surveys include a disability related item so that you can measure employee engagement and satisfaction using disability as a characteristic. And don't forget to seek input from other sources too, such as disability affinity groups. Next slide. In terms of health and wellness, there are some important things to consider. Make sure that any incentives tied to health and wellness don't unintentionally rule out or create unfavorable outcomes for people with disabilities. Make sure that there are multiple alternatives for achieving milestones which might earn those incentives. And of course, it's not permissible to discriminate against a person with a disability in relation to insurance coverage. Benefits options should be well understood and conveyed to employees with disabilities so that they may take advantage of them. Next slide. You can include specific non-discrimination statements in descriptions of benefits and highlight the range of benefits that you offer to employees, especially mental health services and EAP benefits and any other healthcare services that might be particularly attractive to employees with disabilities or increase a sense of belonging in the workplace. Next slide. In terms of helping to allay privacy concerns, it's helpful to be really transparent about why the data is being collected and how it's being used. It's a good idea to use a secure online system where feasible, which is separate from other personnel documents like performance evaluations. Explain that self-ID is requested of all employees, but it's voluntary. And make sure to convey that all self-ID data is kept separate from application materials and is not accessible to hiring managers or supervisors. 
and make sure that you regularly monitor the fidelity of adherence to those important confidentiality procedures. Next slide. Just like we are all now being encouraged to complete the census because of the way that information is ultimately used to benefit citizens, you can explain to employees how self-ID ultimately benefits the workforce in the form of a more welcoming, inclusive, and accessible work environment. And that self-ID data can help you to identify gaps in recruitment and advancement strategies to ensure representation of people with disabilities across all job categories. Next slide. It is often also helpful to explain that self-ID information may be used to improve disability inclusion efforts and provide the right type of supports in the workplace. Use the self-ID form to communicate your commitment to disability as diversity and increase representation of people with disabilities accordingly. And for those of you with disability focused ERGs or affinity groups, ask for their help in communicating the importance of self-ID perhaps making that a regular part of the onboarding process for new employees. Next slide. And finally, we've included some resources here to help you find additional information on this and many other topics related to disability inclusion in the workforce. And we would be happy to have you reach out with any additional questions. Thank you so much for joining us. Next slide, Eduardo. Thank you so much. This is Catherine McCary again. I want to say a special thank you to Kevin and Elise who took the time out of their huge busy schedule in these days to help us record this information. We really look forward to a future time when we can meet together in person soon. But if you want information about upcoming sessions, be sure to sign up for our newsletter. Thank you all for joining us and we look forward to our next session. Okay. Okay. So that, that went much faster than a webinar normally does. <laughs> I guess because when you're reading a script to be sure that you get everything right in a recording. <laughs> well, at least we didn't have a half an hour of introductions. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Do you and think ultimately, it's probably a little more usable for people anyway, if it's brief. Yeah, I thought it was great. Is that how did you all feel? Yeah, thank, thanks, for, uh, Elise, for 